29. Measure 29. Measure 29. Two and three.
afternoon. My name is Ingrid Keller. I'm the executive director for the Western Piedmont Symphony. It is my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of our board of directors to this evening's Fall Pops concert with the Western Piedmont Symphony. I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors that made this event happen. First off, the City of Hickory. Please put your hands together for the City of Hickory. <clears throat> We are so grateful for this partnership and how many years we've been able to bring these concerts here um, on the square and create an outreach effort so that anyone from anywhere can come here and enjoy some nice classical orchestral music. We'd also like to thank HSM Solutions and the Hickory Metro CVB. Please give a round of applause for these folks too. So it is with all of this support that we are here with you this evening. And if there is someone that you know wanted to be here but could not, fear not. We are live streaming right now. So you all could be on TV as well. Um, maybe not TV, but you can, you are on Facebook Live and on YouTube Live. Thanks to Be Pope Productions. Let's give a round of a folks to Be Pope Productions. So let them know they can go to either our Facebook page or the Be Pope Productions Facebook page and they can stream it live from wherever they are um, or they can go to YouTube to Be Pope Productions and stream it live from there. So we're creating as much access as we can today. Um, I hope that you'll come by and see us. We are selling wine and beer over here. So wave your hands, Western Piedmont Symphony, S Paulette over there. Go see us, and you can also, if you don't have a program, we have some programs over there. Some of our board members are going to be walking around at intermission. Um, you might have, they might have caught you before the concert started. We're selling raffle tickets for a season subscription. The tickets are um, one ticket for $2, three tickets for $5, or seven tickets for $10. This will give you an opportunity to win two season subscriptions. These are premier subscriptions to the Western Piedmont Symphony's Masterworks program this year. And the value of that is $350. So for only $10 of a donation, you could win two premier seats to the Western Piedmont Symphony this year. So I hope you'll take advantage of that opportunity and do that. We'll do the drawing right before the last piece of, on the program. So expect that and stick around for that. The um, Catawba Valley Quilters Guild is with us today because our program is called Quilting Building Blocks of Music. So they have a table set up over there. They have a show at the Hickory Metro Convention Center on October 11th to 13th. And they're also raffling off a locally made quilt. And you can stop by and see them over there just beside of our table. And I encourage you to do that. Some of you may have noticed that Maestro John Gordon Ross came out of retirement today. <laughs> <laughs> for this concert. <laughs> so we're so glad to have him back today. He's um, conducting some of our, uh, actually all of our education concerts this year um, for the schools and then today and several other outreach concerts that we're doing in Catawba County and throughout the region as far up as Avery County and the mountains. Um, but we, while we will never replace him as our conductor, we do have to find someone who can lead the orchestra into the future. And to do that, we are undertaking the Maestro Challenge. You'll see on the back of your program the series of uh, concerts that we have this year. The Masterwork series in particular um, is when we are bringing four different candidates from all over the world. And I do say the world. One is coming from Barcelona. <laughs> for, and um, um, but the first con uh, candidate is going to be with us on October the 6th. That is M uh, Maestro Matthew Troy, and he will be leading a program called Mystery Science and Theater. And on that program is a variety of pieces, including the Scheherazade and a piece from the, the Suite from Vertigo, the movie Vertigo. So it's a pretty big, an interesting program, and I hope you'll come to that. In every program, for every concert, there will be a survey because we are looking to you, the community, to help us choose the next conductor for our orchestra. And we'll be compiling all of that data, so we hope that you will take the time to fill out one of those surveys when you come to our 
concerts. Um, we want to compile all that data, and then our search committee will look at that and then really take that into consideration when we are um, making that recommendation to our board of directors for our next conductor. If you are interested in coming to those concerts, you do need tickets for that. Um, you can get those at wpsymphony.org. You may come by our office. We're open five days, Monday through Friday from 10 to 4. Um, you can also call our office, 828-324-8603. <laughs> um, the easiest way is to get tickets online. Those are available 24-7. You can also buy tickets at the door for all of our concerts, too. So I do hope that you'll come out and help us pick our next maestro with the maestro challenge in addition to our website you can connect with us on almost all the social medias that are commonly used facebook twitter instagram youtube snapchat <laughs> all of those so if you um, would like to connect with us in one of those means i encourage you to um, take out your phones and take lots of selfies and videos today and let everyone know that you are enjoying wonderful music here in hickory north carolina Folks, please enjoy the Fall Pops, quilting building blocks of music under the direction of Maestro John Gordon Ross with the Western Piedmont Symphony. Thank you. So today our program is entitled Quilting, Building Blocks of Music. And we're going to start off with the simplest and perhaps the most important to many, many listeners, building block of music, and that's the tune or the melody. So as we go back in the written history of music, and of course as classical musicians, we're, we're mostly about the written history of music, we'd look probably first to the music of the church. So here is a simple plain chant melody, maybe from the 10th or 11th century, but it might be a melody with which some of you are familiar.
Now, let's take that melody and put it into an arrangement, add some harmony to it, some solo instruments, distinctly uh, non-10th century music. Here's an arrangement of, of, the lover, of the Father's Love Begotten. Here's an even more well-known melody 
some people have said this might be one of the oldest melodies around. I don't know. It's also even been attributed to Henry the Eighth, who, while he was courting Anne Boleyn, supposedly at least, supposedly, perhaps, I think is probably a better word, perhaps wrote the lyrics. But very possibly this tune, Green Sleeves, already existed. Rafe Vaughn Williams, a, a composer who sort of bridges the late 19th and 20th centuries, wrote an opera about John Falstaff called Sir John in Love. And in Sir John in Love, he uses green sleeves.
wind will always find a concert. I don't think there's been much wind all day, but as soon as, of course, we start playing and we've got to hold our music together, the wind shows up. It's a nice breeze. I'm grateful for it. I hope you are, too. Yeah. Well, next we're going to play for you a piece that I think helps explain the origins and how composers began to think about harmony. This is a piece called a canon. That is to say it is a piece in strict imitation. Everybody knows row, row, row your boat. That's a canon, a piece in strict imitation. Well, I don't know, in my elementary music class it always wasn't so strict, but, but the idea was that it's supposed to be. Well, the eighth tune by the British composer Thomas Tallis, written about 1576, somewhere in there, in that neighborhood, is such a piece. In fact, at, uh, at the church service I attended this morning, we sang it as the tune used in the doxology. And I have to tell you, I sing in the choir, I'm always tempted to wait a bar and come in a bar late. So it turns out to be a canon. One of these days I'm going to do that and see what happens to the poor choir director or organist. But uh, at any rate, for now, here's our little arrangement of Talus's eighth tune or the Talus canon.
just as it's been theorized that some of the plaint chant melodies of the Roman and Byzantine churches came from tunes that might have been known by people on the street, perhaps even with secular words. It's certainly true of many of the chorales of the early Lutheran church. And many of these chorales, of course, were uh, enhanced by wonderful settings by Lutheranism's finest composer, Johann Sebastian Bach. We're going to play for you first a piece by Heinrich Isak called Innsbruck, I Must Now Leave Thee. And then we're going to follow that almost immediately with a piece called O World, I Must Now Leave Thee, a setting of the same tune by Isak but a setting by Johann Sebastian Bach. So Innsbruck, I must now leave thee. It'll be easy to tell when they change. Woodwinds play Innsbruck, strings play the world. Now, music begins to get more complex. The wonderful counterpoint of Johann Sebastian Bach. Bach underwent, like most musicians of his generation, a fairly long apprenticeship. He wasn't always the famous music director of the Thomas Kirche in Leipzig. He was in several smaller towns, amongst them Arnstadt. And while he was in Armstadt, he wrote the first of his two great fugues in the key of G minor. However, this one is known as the lesser, perhaps because it was the first and it's a little bit shorter and maybe candidly a little bit complex than the great fugue in G minor. But here is some counterpoint now. A fugue, translate that word to flight, if you will, by Johann Sebastian Bach.
That's what was going on in Germany in the early 1700s. But let's move back about 100 years to Vienna, to Venice, rather, at the end of the 16th century, about 1597 in Venice. The Gabrielli family had been an important family, like the box to music in northern Germany, the Gabriellis to music of the Venetian style. Giovanni's uncle, Andrea, had been an important composer at the court of the Doge. And Giovanni would be an important composer as well, best known perhaps for his canzona, but also for a piece that he wrote fairly early on, 1597, called the Sonata Piano e Forte, for two distinct choirs. I rewrote the piece for our little orchestra here, the first choir being the string section, the second choir being uh, part of our brass section. We're going to let the trumpets take a little break and rest their lips. But this was a way for Gabrielli to deal with the issue of dynamics, louds and softs, which up until this time had not been pr a big issue in music. Music was pretty much played, as far as we can tell, at the same dynamic. So he adds spatial elements, particularly in the buildings where he served as a church musician, the Church of San Rocco, the great Church of San Marco with the famous piazza that we all see in, in so many pictures with all the famous birds. And of course, these days it's underwater most of the time. But uh, at any rate, certainly one of the most important buildings architecturally and musically in the history of the world. So here is the Sonata Piano e Forte, Giovanni Gabrielli.
good comes out of war, but sometimes, musically, some interesting things do happen. If you know your European or world history, you know that the empire of the Habsburgs, also we called it the Austro-Hungarian Empire, was frequently under attack from the south. And the results of that have even been seen in the 20th and 21st centuries as we've had warring elements primarily religious and ethnic wars in that part of the world below what was once the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Serbia, Croatia, Montenegro, Herzegovina, I can't pronounce that more than once and I don't think I got it right the first time. But at any rate, those countries are still sources of world conflict. And of course, came, came along with expressions that we've come to know sadly like ethnic cleansing. Well, it was, it was such in the 18th century and the early 19th century as well. But one thing that the Austrians decided to steal from the Ottomans or the Turks as we know them today was some of the percussion effects in their marching units that would come out in front of the army. They had something that Europeans called the jingling Johnny. It involved the cymbals, the triangle, the bass drum, making really quite a lot of noise so that you knew the Ottoman army was coming. So obviously the Ottomans weren't concerned, excuse me, I conduct with the sun in my eyes. The Ottomans weren't so concerned about surprising the, Vien the Viennese, rather, they were really trying to scare them to death before they even got there. Well, European composers picked up on it, like Haydn, like Mozart, who both wrote Turkish marches, and perhaps one of the most famous Turkish marches from the incidental music to the play The Ruins of Athens was by jo uh, Ludwig von Beethoven. So Beethoven wrote this little march it was written originally for piano, but orchestrated as part of a larger set of music for the ruins of Athens. Uh, I believe the work premiered in 1811, but the whole score was revived again for the opening of the Josefstadt Theater in Vienna in 1822, although Beethoven decided to write another overture, an overture that we did on my last Masterworks concert, Consecration of the House. But I thought it would be fun for you to hear a little bit of the music from the ruins of Athens. This is music also that takes that element of dynamics and uses it in a different way. You hear the army coming. The army is there. And fortunately for us, they decide to keep moving. They're going to go.
and a somewhat, someone else. So here is the Turkish march from the ruins of Athens by Ludwig van Beethoven. In 1924, the Republic of Italy, at least many of its citizens, probably thought their greatest days were behind them. The days of the great Roman legions and the great victories and, and Rome ruling the world. But the composer Ottorino Respighi had chosen to write a set of tone poems. First, he wrote a set of four movements called the Fountains of Rome, describing the beautiful fountains like the Trevi Fountain, for example. Next, he would write the Pines of Rome, and finally, a work called Roman Festivals about the wonderful debauchery. Well, yeah, it is kind of wonderful debauchery if you look, if you look at uh, the way the Italians still today, I think, know how to party in a way that maybe we in America don't quite embrace yet. Uh, that might be a good thing too, by the way. I'm not suggesting that, uh, that we do all those things. But, but in Italy, those festivals are still important today and really go back to the ancient, ancient traditions that predate the Roman church and Christianity and all of that. We're going to play for you an arrangement of the last movement of the Pines of Rome, like the Beethoven. It describes the glory that was Rome, the approaching Roman legions. You can kind of sense them in the distance, and then you can hear them coming full-blown and triumphant with the spoils of war. Here is The Pines of the Appian Way by Ottorino Respighi. This will close our first half. We'll take a little intermission after this, so please do visit one of our tables and take a moment or two to stretch. I'm going to take a moment or two to towel off so I can see the music on this second half.
We'll see you in another 15 minutes.
So the next block in our quilt is the rhythmic block. A lot of the music, of course, on the first half was slow, sustained, as was the character of a lot of music in those days, although certainly people have danced from time in memoriam. Uh, let's go at least back to Joshua. We know that there was plenty of dancing and, and loud playing going on, else the walls of Jericho would still be standing today. But uh, at any rate, we're going to play for you now some music from Bizet's opera Carmen, Dance of the Bohemians. It starts out kind of slow and sedately to some degree, almost elegantly. But as Carmen does her dance, it gets wilder and wilder and wilder and more rhythmic and more rhythmic and more rhythmic. Here's the Dance of the Bohemians from the opera Carmen. Thank you. 
even though Bizet was a French composer, obviously he took the music of Spain, those wonderful dances from Spain, and created what remains today the most oft-performed, the most popular of all operas. Next, we're going to play for you a little piece by the Australian composer, Arthur Benjamin. I say Australian, he was born in Sydney, grew up in Brisbane, but also spent a good part of his life in England and in Canada. He was a pilot in World War I. He had the distinction of being shot down by Hermann Goering, familiar name, who would later be head of the Luftwaffe in World War II. Spent most of World War I in a prisoner camp, but when he got, got out, he went back to work, musically speaking. He liked, to, he liked to travel, and on his travels, he included what was then the British colony of Jamaica. And as he visited Jamaica, he heard a wonderful little tune. I believe it was called the Mongo Stomp. And he adapted it into a piece that he called the Jamaican Rumba. It was, to put it candidly, a jukebox hit, an instrumental piece that became a jukebox hit. In fact, it became so popular, and the Jamaicans were so happy and so pleased with the recognition that it brought to their little island. Not so little. It's the second largest island, I believe, in the Caribbean. But uh, at any rate, they gave Arthur Benjamin a keg of rum every year for the rest of his life. Now that's royalties. Growing up in the era of the Cold War, I was born in 1951, I remember one of the distinctive things that would happen is that many of America's most famous musical artists would tour. Amongst the tours, of course, the Soviet Union, obviously, at the time of a way of maybe trying to break the freeze initially with, with cultural engagement, but also places after World War II like the Middle East. The Dave Brubeck Quartet was touring the Middle East, and in one of the souks in Turkey, 
Dave heard a tune, heard a bunch of street musicians playing a tune, and he just couldn't get the rhythm out of his head. And he, and he asked the musicians, he said, well, you know, where's this come from? And the musician said, well, this rhythm to Turks is like blues to a jazz musician. So he thought, I'll borrow that rhythm, and I'll call it blues rondo a la Turk. Of course, even better than growing up with the angst of the Cold War, worrying about whether we would get nuked tomorrow or, or whatever, was watching television on usually Saturday afternoons, sometimes even Sunday afternoons. And I believe it was the CBS network that would show the New York Philharmonic and this curly-headed guy with a big hooked nose named Leonard Bernstein. Wow, how many of us grew up on those concerts. And how many, even though they're in black and white, and I don't think they've ever been colorized, I hope some of you young people will take, an exam, uh, take our example and, uh, and check them out, because wonderful teaching is wonderful teaching, whether it's in color or black and white. And he was a, he was a genius. He could do so many things. He was a fine pianist. He was a wonderful conductor. He was a wonderful composer. But I think, of all things, he was a great teacher. And you might not know it, but I think a lot of you probably do. This year is his 100th birthday. In fact, it wasn't, it wasn't too long ago. So we're at least briefly going to celebrate his 100th birthday with one of my favorite tunes from West Side Story. It appears on the front end of the show. Here's a little bit of Something's Coming.
And that's all we've got. But, you know, obviously Lenny did something with this show. Of course, the subject was great, even though it was really just, in simple terms, a remake of Romeo and Juliet. But it also pitted two immigrant groups against one another, the Italians and the Puerto Ricans. Their styles of music, their styles of living. But he does a great job of melding that music and, of course, incorporating for the first time not American jazz, that had certainly been done before, but the style of American jazz called bebop. And I think that's what makes this show so interesting and unique. That and, of course, some of the mixed meter in songs like Something's Coming really kind of took that Broadway musical and the music of that musical into a, into a whole new realm. Now we're going to play for you some pieces that concern themselves with the building blocks of tempo and speed. And we're going to start out slowly with a very famous work song. In fact, maybe one of the most famous work songs. Song of the Volga Boatman. Now today, if you run up and down the Volga River, you can do it with Viking cruises and with all of these uh, wonderful ships and, and the wines are very good and things like that. But when they were moving goods up and down that river, not so hard to take it down the river, but back up very, very strenuous work. And the work, the people on the boat, the polemen, had to work together. And one of the ways to facilitate that was to sing together. And I imagine some of the voices were pretty good, like that Boris Kristof low bass sound that you, that you think of when you think of Russians. And I imagine some of them were just like us, not very good singers, but enthusiastic singers, because their rhythm and timing depended on it. Song of the Volga Boatman.
In 1860, Johann Strauss, the Waltz King of Vienna, was commissioned by the Technological Institute of Vienna to write a waltz for their ball. Well, Johann Strauss was a modestly, I would say, singularly non-technological person. You know, he came to the United States during our bicentennial for some super concerts, and he had to ride the train between New York and Boston, and he never quite got over it. That train went 35 miles an hour, <laughs> and it scared the living daylights out of him. It had happened before in Austria he had ridden a train. He'd written a, a railway polka, and, and they asked him to you know, to ride on this special train in Austria. And he said, never again. I'm never getting on a train for the rest of my life. But he had to do it in America to get between a concert he was doing in New York and to rehearse a concert that he would do in Boston. So he did it again. But I can tell you, definitely not a technological guy. But he came from a large family. And as I recall, one of his brothers was a pretty decent engineer. It might have been Edward or Josef. I can't remember which one. But uh, he didn't feel too ill at ease in writing a piece for the Technological Institute. And you can hear maybe in this waltz, in the introduction, some machine sounds. And then he called it the acceleration waltz. So there are places in the piece where it certainly lives up to that name as well. The Acceleration Waltz by Johann Strauss.
Teen and the Shark. <laughs> you know, sometimes when you plan a program, plans don't always work out. And I'm not sure how I make an excuse about cutting the next piece on the program, the minute waltz, the shortest piece on the whole program, and we didn't have time to rehearse it. Sounds like a phony excuse, doesn't it? Anybody ever played the minute waltz? Then you understand why, because it's, it's pretty darn difficult, and we didn't truly didn't have time to rehearse it. So we're going to play for you now. Uh, as it gets dark, we'll play for as, as long as we can still see the music. I think we'll make it to the end. Uh, we're going to play for you now a little march by Shostakovich. Shostakovich, in about 1931, 32, was asked to write incidental music for a production in the Soviet Union of the Shakespeare play Hamlet, but not quite a conventional production. How do I say it? Hamlet as a comedy? Yeah, probably not. It actually never made it to the stage. If the censors hadn't gotten it, somebody else would, but the whole thing just, just collapsed. You know, it, it kind of sounds like an Ackroyd Belushi project or something like that. Just didn't quite make it, to, uh, make it to film. So Shostakovich had written all this wonderful music, so he at least published a suite. And by the way, he used a lot of these themes in other pieces, like his first piano concerto. Well, a whole bunch of pieces. Several of his symphonies, themes from this incidental music appear. So we're going to play for you now the final movement, Fortinbras March. Well, it's about Star Wars time again, isn't it? December, we get another movie? You know, uh, it's not my favorite film of the Star Wars series, but I have to tell you, I love Return of the Jedi, and if for no other reason, those furry little gremlin-like creatures, the Ewoks. Yeah, I'm an Ewok guy. I love the Ewoks, who, you know, with their, with their bows and arrows and their slings and things like that. Talk about David and Goliath. You know, 
here are the here are the stormtroopers with all their technology and these guys with their ropes and slings and arrows almost single-handedly defeat the empire so i think they at least deserve their own march and here it is John Philip Sousa, as Strauss is known as the Waltz King in Europe, of course Sousa is known as the March King, not just really in the United States, but all over the world. Sousa just wrote a lot of good marches. But a lot of people don't realize, first of all, Sousa was a violinist. When Jacques Offenbach, the composer of the Can Can and all of those wonderful French operettas, came to the United States to tour, Sousa was his concertmaster. 
and frequently in his younger days, would serve in orchestras on Broadway in New York and, and a lot of other places and in the theaters of Washington as well. A lot of the members of the military bands in those days moonlighted. And in fact, uh, I can remember even during the Vietnam War, a few of those same folks moonlighted. Um, that is to say, during the day, they would play their military obligations. And at night, if they were free, they would go someplace else, maybe play in a local or regional orchestra or play some other kind of job to supplement their income. And musicians have been doing that forever. The other thing that probably a lot of people don't know about Sousa is that he also wrote operettas. That is to say, he wrote a lot of light opera. Probably his most famous and the one that's still done most often today is El Capitan. But this march, the freelance march on to victory, is a part of his opera called Freelance from 1904. Sure. 
So we're going to draw for our um, season subscription. It's actually two season subscriptions. So we're going to let Maestro John Gordon Ross draw for us. Um, really quick, I do just want to say again, thank you to our sponsors, the City of Hickory. Thank you so much for their partnership. Also, HSM Solutions and the Hickory Metro CVB. Thank you so much to these folks for making this event possible. We had great weather, actually. <laughs> And also, make sure you um, share with someone who was not here today the live stream. It's on YouTube and on Facebook, Be Pope Productions. I know that we've got people watching from all over. In fact, one of our longtime supporters, Adam Neely, is watching right now. So everyone say hi to Adam Neely. <laughs> hi, Adam. The Red Sox are going to get beat tonight. <laughs> All the way from Massachusetts. Oh, John just had to do that. Um, so we're going to go ahead and draw for the prize now for the season subscriptions. Rachel, why don't you draw? Oh, okay. Sure. So, yeah. I don't need it. We can get a drum roll, really. Oh, that's okay. Drum roll? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You can do it. Three, nine, eight. Two, two, six, three. Three, nine, eight, two, two, six, three. Come on up. And three, eight, three, three, zero, oh, eight, seven. Three, eight, three, three, zero, oh, eight, seven. Aha, there we go. Well, congratulations. And everybody, I really urge you to get involved with the selection of our next conductor. This is a great orchestra. It's been my privilege for many years to conduct it. But it's a time when I think it's time for new leadership. And we have four great candidates. So really make an effort to come and observe all four, hear their concerts. They're doing some great music. It's going to be a fabulous experience. And of course, the Tesla Quartet is back. How many of you heard them last night? Wow. I mean, you know, what can I say? We're so lucky here in Hickory to have those folks. Now, you're lucky because you're going to get one more number, and then you can go home or go to dinner or, uh, like me, go home and watch the uh, Indians beat the Red Sox. Yeah, I know. Red Sox fans travel, even to Hickory, and there are a lot of you. There are a lot of you. But uh, at any rate, uh, we close our school concerts this year with uh, a wonderful piece. Our last little quilting block was about tempos and how tempos serve, serve different functions, like the song of the Volga Boatman, like the march, and like this last piece. When the cavalry comes to the rescue, you know you're going to hear this. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thanks, Rachel.